Hey everyone, I'm going to be doing something a bit different today. I'm going to be testing dual channel versus single channel configurations for RAM in some games to see if it actually makes a difference in performance. If you want dual channel performance, this is the correct configuration on a Ford and motherboard, but what if you accidentally install your RAM like this? It's not a mistake many would make, but those just starting out building their first PC can and have done this, then are left clueless as to why it's not performing maybe as well as they thought it would have. Plus, it's something I've been personally interested in for a while now, and wanted to see what kind of impact it has on my own PC, which runs an i7-6700K overclocked to 4.7GHz on an MSI Z270 SLI Plus motherboard, 16GB of Corsair Vengeance LPX DDR4 RAM overclocked to 2800MHz, with timings of 12, 13, 13, 29, and an MSI GTX 1080 Armour OC with plus 130 MHz on the core and plus 600 on the memory clocks. First up for the games we're going to be testing today is Killing Floor 2, the sequel to 2009's Killing Floor. Killing Floor 2 was released on PC and PS4 on November 18th, 2016 and August 28th, 2017 for Xbox One. The PC did have an early access version, however, which released in April 2015. We'll be running the game at 1080p on the max settings with VSync off, and bloom, lens flares, depth of field and motion blur switched off as well, as I really don't like those effects at all. Normally I play on 1440p, but 1080p is the maximum my capture card will do. In dual channel mode the performance was pretty good, as can be expected with a 6700K at 4.7GHz, and a GTX 1080 with plus 130 on the core and plus 600 on the VRAM. I conducted the test across a playthrough of a 4 wave survival game on the Z landing map with suicidal difficulty. Not really much to say about this performance wise other than fantastic. A perhaps benchmark showed that across the 4 wave game the dual channel configuration managed an average of 270 FPS and 1% and 0.1% lows of 174 and 60 FPS respectively. Moving on to single channel, and I didn't really notice any difference at all, other than some very occasional stutter, which I can't pin down to the single channel RAM configuration. But according to a Fraps benchmark, there was a hit to performance, with an average FPS of 250, and 1% and 0.1% lows of 149 and 59 frames per second respectively. Around a 20 FPS hit, to average in 1% frame rates, but the FPS is so high anyway that it isn't noticeable, but there is definitely a hit with single channel RAM compared to dual channel. Next up is probably one of my favourite games, Forza Horizon 3, and as it uses DirectX 12, I can't run a Fraps benchmark, but the MSI Afterburner overlay is there for you to keep an eye on FPS instead. Forza Horizon 3 released on 27th of September 2016 for Xbox One and PC, and features cross-platform play between the two, and was the first Forza game to make an appearance on the PC, as it was always an Xbox exclusive beforehand. We'll run this at 1080p on the max settings as well, with VSync and Motion Blur both turned off. I wasn't really sure how to test this consistently across both configurations, so I just did a couple of races. One on the Deepwater cross-country map, and another on the Apostles Beach cross-country map. Performance as expected was perfect on the dual channel config, with no hiccups or stutters at all. Not that I was expecting there to be. The FPS tended to be around 95 to 120 FPS, depending on where in the open world you are. On the single channel configuration, however, I did notice a hit to performance with some stutter when going through water that wasn't apparent beforehand, and on reviewing the footage afterwards, there seemed to be a performance hit of roughly 15 to 20 frames per second compared to the dual channel configuration. You'll definitely notice a performance hit if you're using a high refresh rate monitor in this game. Next up is Fortnite Battle Royale, the free to play and arguably one of the most popular games out right now. Initially released as an early access game for Windows, Mac OS, PS4 and Xbox One in September 2017. It features up to 100 players in a battle to the death, with the last man or woman standing declared the winner. Although if you're me, you usually die pretty quickly with a kill or two spread across every couple of games. After all, my in-game name isn't King Dizelot for nothing. The game will run on a massive range of hardware, which is one of the reasons for its popularity, that, and it's extremely fun as well. On the dual channel RAM configuration, at 1080p, max settings with motion blur off, the FPS ranged around 150 to 200 frames per second, but tended to stick nearer to the 200, and the performance was pretty good with no problems with stutter or anything like that at all. A fraps bench across a few games showed an average of 195 frames per second and 1%, 0.1% lows of 123 and 80 frames per second respectively. Great for all of you high refresh rate gamers out there. 
Moving on to single channel, and the performance didn't really dip that much, with no obvious stutters or any other performance issues at all. There was a small hit to performance though, which the FRAPS benchmark shows, with an average of 182 and 1% and 0.1% lows of 127 and 59 frames per second respectively, although it's highly unlikely you'll notice a 21 frames per second drop in 0.1% lows unless you're more used to high refresh rate monitors. Now it's on to the final game for today, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, a battle royale style game originally released as an early access game on PC in March 2017, but it had its public release on 20th of December 2017 for PC, 12th of December 2017 on Xbox One, and on Android and iOS it had its release on 9th of February 2018 and 19th of March 2018 for China and the rest of the world respectively. We'll be running the game at 1080p on the Mac settings with VSync off. On the dual channel configuration, the game as expected ran pretty well with no performance issues other than occasionally entering the game mid skydive or when the player was already in the ground out in the open. In the waiting area however before the match starts, there wasn't really any performance problems, with FPS often hitting the 144 frames per second limit in the game. When diving, the game achieved around 115 frames per second, with some dips to around 100 and on the ground the FPS occasionally dipped into the 60s indoors, but tended to be around 120 frames per second and above in other areas. This entirely depends on the map you're on though. A fraps bench across a few games showed an average of 112 frames per second, with 1% and 0.1% lows of 65 and 37 frames per second respectively. So there was some stutter, which I didn't pick up on, but will probably be noticed across a longer period of gameplay. The single channel configuration didn't really make a difference with performance pretty much the same as the dual channel configuration, although I was on different maps at times, so the performance shouldn't really be compared that much. A FRAPS benchmark showed the single channel configuration achieving an average of 116 frames per second and 1% and 0.1% lows of 74 and 38 frames per second respectively. This increases down to the different maps used, which I can't control for unfortunately. But overall, I wouldn't say that the single channel configuration had much of a performance hit, if any at all. Overall, I was a bit surprised at the results in a few games, with some of them showing not that much difference at all, and others showing a hit of around 20 frames per second. I was expecting it to be an almost night and day difference in terms of performance, but it really wasn't, at least not with the 60Hz display that I'm using. On a higher refresh rate monitor, however, you'll definitely notice if your games are running 20 frames per second less than normal. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Hopefully you'll tune in for the next one.